Okay, so we are back live, apart from the fact that I haven't uh, shown this, the slides to, uh, to your guys, to the guys who are here, the guys and gals. So here they can see it again. And uh, we are ready to continue with uh, our uh, study of the algorithm that Kleene gave us to convert regular expressions into NFAs uh, that accept exactly the strings that match the pattern described by the regular expression. We have dealt with several cases, three of the three base cases and the union construct. But of course we are not there yet because there are two more cases to consider. If you are a good honest to God algorithm that is supposed to convert regular expressions into NFAs, you have to consider also the case that the regular expression you receive as input is of the form A concatenated with B, where A and B are regular expressions, and of the form A star, where A is a regular expression. In both cases, we unleash the power of recursion to obtain via recursive call to ourselves, if supposing we are playing the algorithm, the automata for the sub-component regular expressions, but we need to understand how to combine the results that we get in order to get the automaton for the regular expression we start from. So let's do first of all the case A followed by B. Hmm? Let's do this and see whether it helps. I'll have, oh, something changed. Let's try this. So let's assume that we have our automaton for capital A, and let's take the same example that we had before. Not that I don't like blue, but uh, let me turn to black. Okay, so we have the two example automata that we get by recursion that we had before. Eh? They are small, but they will highlight the idea behind the general construction. And then I will actually also show you the general construction in Rosen's book because it's wrong. And we'll figure out where it's wrong. Hmm? Okay, so think of the composition as semicolon in a programming language. A followed by B. So if you, a string has to match the pattern A followed by B, then it should have an initial part that matches the pattern A. And then once the pattern A has been matched, we jump to the second automaton, the one for B, and we check whether what remains of the string matches the pattern described by B. So first A, then B. So this somehow makes you think that the check-in should flow from the first automaton to the second automaton at some point. Now, my question to you is, when does it make, chase, when does it make sense to change from A to B? From an accept state in the first automaton. Uh, because if you reach an accept state in the first automaton, then it means you might have seen a string, well, you actually have seen a string that matches the first pattern. At that point, it makes sense to tr move to the second automaton to check if what remains matches the second pattern. Well, how do you change? So, what you would like to do, really, and this is what you would be able to do if you were using epsilon transitions, is somehow to connect the final state of the first automaton to the start state of the second one by means of a transition that reads nothing. But since Rosen does not allow us, uh, allow us to do this, we need to simu simulate this behavior. So instead of looking at the final state here, we look at all of the transitions that go into the final state. And somehow we redirect them 
Okay, so let's do it. So this is the automaton for A dot B, uh, the specific example. Okay, so uh, this A label transition that we have here uh, brings the automaton from this state to a final state. So we want to redirect this transition to go to the start state of the second automaton. Because after you read the A, you want to check for the pattern by B. Okay, so we redirect this. Moreover, does it make sense to have this as a final state in the automaton? Well, not anymore, because you can only be happy if you check both A and B. So, well, since the state was not particularly big, I just erased it all, but now I turned it into a non-accept state. And of course, this should be labeled A. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good question. The question is, what happens if the first machine accepts the empty string? Mm -hmm. In that case, we should be able to start immediately by checking the pattern checked by the second automaton. So let's look at this exam at an example. So suppose, for instance, that my first automaton was something that looked like that. Hmm? And the second automaton was something like this, same as before. Hmm? Now, what are the strings that match the pattern? So the first thing is actually matching for something of the form A union lambda, hmm? because it's either accepts A or lambda. The second one matches the pattern B. So what we want is an automaton, the results from our construction, that accepts, that accepts what strings? A, B, or B. Hmm? So what is it that we do? Uh, we actually, uh, le let's do it on a different color here. So what we want to be able to do is to jump from the start state here to any so this should be an accept state. Huh? We want to start from here. We want to jump to any state that the start state of the second automaton can reach. So you want to be able to accept the B. So this actually has a transition like this. Hmm? So if the start state of the first automaton is an accept state, then what you want to do is uh, to connect, to add to that state all the transitions that the start state of the second automaton can do. And moreover, you still have the thing that we had before, namely from uh, this state, you will also have an A transition going to the start state of the other automaton. And moreover, should this be an accept state? The start, it shouldn't be an accept state. It should only be an accept state if the empty string is accepted by both of the component automata. If the first one accepts lambda and the second one accepts lambda, then lambda matches both the first regular expression and the second one. Lambda matches both A and B. But in that case, it matches A followed by B. Because lambda concatenated with lambda is lambda. 
Let me show you the uh, construction that Rosen gives. I don't know whether you can actually read this thing, uh, but if you can't, it really... It's a lot of text. But I'll show you just a picture that he draws. And the picture is here. Okay? So this is the automaton for the pattern A. This is the automaton for the, pat for the pattern B. How do you combine them together, Rosen says? Okay, first of all, you just take an automaton that has all of the states that you have here and all of the states that you have in the automaton for B. So far, so good. Then you want control to flow from the first automaton to the second one. Every time the first automaton can enter the final state, the combined automaton should be able to jump similarly to the start state of the second automaton. Because that's when control is supposed to flow from the automaton for A to the automaton for B. So whenever you have an I labeled transition here from uh, a state in the first automaton to an accept state in the first automaton, you have an A I labeled transition to the start state in the second automaton. That's what we had before. That's how control flows from one to the other. So far, so good. Rosen also says in the text, even though it's not shown here in the picture, that the start state here will be an accept state if and only if this was an accept state before and this was an accept state before. That is to say, if lambda is matched by the first, is accepted by the first automaton and by the second one, then it should be accepted by the first followed by the second. Lambda followed by lambda is lambda. Cool. But then Rosen also says, for every transition that you have from S of B, the start state from the second automaton, you add a corresponding transition from the start state of the first automaton to it. You always do that. Well, that's, where, that's what is not right. You should only do this if this is an accept state. Because if this isn't an accept state, it doesn't work. Why? Well, here we have an example. Let's, el let's elaborate on it a little bit. So let's follow what Rosen says. Okay, so suppose that I have a, my automaton here is this one. My automaton here is this one. Note, this is not an accept state. This start state here is not an accept state. Huh? Not accepting. Where Rosen says, okay, we redirect this A edge to the start state of the second automaton. That's okay. Excuse me for the whistle. Uh, it's, uh, it comes naturally. Sometimes, at least. Okay, so this is not an, an accept state anymore. That's fine. But, Rosen also says, always from the start state of this automaton, add the transition that mimics the transitions from the start state of the second automaton, which means you have a B transition going there. And now you see that the automaton that we have not only accepts the string AB, which is right, but it also accepts the string B, which is wrong. Yeah, because uh, the string B does not match that. So it's a small mistake, but the, it's easy to make these mistakes, and it happens to everyone. So whenever you make a mistake, you can pat yourself in the back. Well, no, you shouldn't pat yourself in the back. You should say, okay, let me get better. But on the other hand, it's human to make mistakes. On the other hand, to continue making the same mistake all the time, it's of the devil, as people say in Italy. Uh, to err is human, but you shouldn't uh, clean star that error. Uh, okay, excellent. 
So we have only one thing to do, the star, talking about the cleaning star of the error. So uh, what do we do? So it's too, so dark in here, I had trouble finding the pen now. They should, they should make it luminescent. Okay, so the algorithm says, you've given me a star. I'll show you how to build an automaton that recognizes this pattern, given that by recursion, I built an automaton that recognizes the pattern A. Okay, so suppose that the automaton that I was given by recursion is something of this form. Just by example, this will allow us to figure out what the general pattern is. Okay, that's my automaton for A. Hmm? How do I massage this automaton so that it accepts A star? Okay, remember, A star is, accept, is always matched by the empty string and by any concatenation of strings that match the pattern A. So any concatenation sort of indicates looping. Eh? I want to run the automaton uh, for A as many times as I need, possibly zero times. Okay, so how do, we do, how do I do that? Well, first of all, I add a new start state and I make it final. Why do I make it final? Because you can do it zero times, because I want to accept lambda always. Fantastic. But it would be pretty boring if this new start state was not connected to the automaton for A. So how do I connect it to the automaton for A? So if you don't iterate zero times, you want to iterate, you want to run through the automaton for A at least once. Okay, so the automaton, the automaton for A starts by taking transitions out that come out of the initial state of that automaton. So I want the new start state to be able to mimic those initial transitions so that it can start behaving like the automaton for A. So in this case, what I do is I just let it mimic the only initial transition. If there are more, it can mimic them all. And of course, this is not a start state anymore. Eh? Ah. Blood. Okay? So now the automaton, the new start state, can actually mimic the automaton for A, but only for one run, for one repetition. I want to do it two, three, n times for any n. So what do I do? Okay, from the final state, I want to go somewhere. Okay, so I want the final state of this automaton to be able to do everything that the initial state of the automaton for A could, go, could do. So I just make it loop here. Everything would be much easier with epsilon transitions, but unfortunately, Rosen doesn't give us epsilon transitions. Uh, the question is, could you not just have the final state to be just the start state? Uh, it's a long story, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea. It's a good idea, but it's a long story. Uh, okay? So that's a general construction. Well, at, at least that's a construction on an example, but that's how it, it works in general. Give me an automaton, sorry, you give me an automaton, add the new start state, make it do everything that the, the old start state in the automaton you gave me could do, and add the loops this way, so that you can iterate as many times as you want. And by the way, the new start state should always be a final state. That's the construction. That's when you have the star. Huh? But you know, so that this works for any automata. So A could be arbitrarily complicated. But recursion takes care of building the automaton that checks for the pattern described by A. 
once recursion spits out a possibly humongously large automaton for that, well, how large it is depends on how large the pattern is, uh, then you always massage it in the same way. You apply the same construction to build from it the automaton for A star. Okay, so the, what is the, oh, the the question? That's a good question. What if instead of A star, you want to do A plus? Okay, your colleague is saying in that case, the only thing that changes is that I don't want always necessarily to match the empty string. So for A plus, the only thing that you would do is to look at this start state and you don't make it accepted. necessarily when is it that you make it accepted not necessarily accepting but for instance what if actually lambda matched A. Then in that case, you should make it accepted. Because then in, then even R plus, A plus is matched by lambda. Because lambda already matches A. So if you write one or more times lambda, you get a, lambda. So in that case, you would have to make that accepted. So the construction depends, says it depends. It depends on, uh, and this is, uh, all these cases really depend on the fact that uh, we are not allowed to use epsilon expression, uh, epsilon transitions in this course. Life would be so much easier if we were allowed to do that. But there you are. Complain with Rose and don't complain with me. Uh, I just don't want to confuse you with something which is much nicer than what it does. And for which I take no credit. Uh, we have to create the cleaning for that. Excellent. So, uh, well, talking about cleaning, there he is. You also worked a lot on the lambda calculus, which is the mother of all functional programming languages, but that's another matter. So, cleaning answered all these questions for us. He gave us regular expressions a while back, nearly 60 years ago. And he showed us how to actually build automata that check for the patterns described by regular expressions, which signaled the birth, 20 years later, of uh, uh, the front end of compiler construction, at least the front of the front end of compiler construction. Excellent. So now we have regular expressions, or regular, lang well, regular languages four ways. If somebody asks you, well, I have this language. Can you convince me that it's regular? You can do one of four different things. Just choose whatever is easier for you. You can build a DFA that accepts it. You can build an NFA that accepts it. You can construct a, a regular grammar that generates the language, or you can give a regular expression that describes the language. And in fact, there are many more beautiful characterizations of regular languages. And you know, when you have many different things of looking at some object, somehow there is always an indication that this object is actually a fundamental one. If you can only describe something in a very ad hoc fashion, then, well, the chances that this thing is actually important are very small. They may be important for you or for the people who discover them, but uh, then they disappear. Regular languages are really fundamental things in computer science. Moreover, the beauty of all of this, if you're a computer scientist, is that not only we have these four different ways of looking at regular languages, but we have algorithms to convert between any two of such type of descriptions. Your friends, your friend perhaps gives you a regular grammar uh, to, describe, uh, to describe a language. You don't like regular grammars, you want an automaton, you press a button, you can get it by means of an algorithm. 
you want a regular expression, you press a button, you get it by means of an algorithm. It's Google Translate for regular expressions, if you wish. Uh, only long before Google Translate. Well, what more do you ask for? Well, you can ask for a lot more, but anyway, sort of that's outside the scope of this course. And uh, in case somebody asks what regular expressions can be used for, uh, here's an answer from XKCD to save the world. And you can read it at your own leisure. Uh, so uh, next time you're a party, save the world or uh, whoever by doing this type of impersonification. But don't crash against the computer. Uh. Okay, so if it's also available from the course, uh, my school page, just in case you don't know what to do later. Uh. So if you want to know more about this stuff, there are courses that I encourage you to take. Compilers, if you are into the hands-on part. Theory of computation, if you want to know really everything you ever wanted to know about regular expressions, finite automata, Turing machine, theory of complexity, that's the course that makes or breaks a computer scientist, if you ask me. It's really the physics of computer science and software engineering, even though software engineers have to take physics. That's the physics, not what they teach uh, a physics one or physics two. And in a future life, modeling and verification, which is a course very close to my heart, not least because I wrote the textbook that is being used there. Uh, and uh, it's not up to me to, to say whether it's a good textbook or not. Okay, fantastic. But what are we going to do now? I told you before. What? Okay. Uh, I told you before that, uh, can you remove this thing? Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Let me kill this thing. Perhaps it's going to help me. I'll go to start it again, even when I need it. Now cancel. No, no, what do I mean cancel? I wanted to kill it off. I don't want to save, okay? Uh, I have no idea what uh, what's happening here. It's the smart thing bar, smart thing. Clear ink. Thank you. Let's hope. Okay. How does that get activated? That's a good question that I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Right side of the screen, you mean my right? Your right, your right. Yeah. A bar in the. Okay, then your left side, I guess. My left side is here. Uh, no, all, the way. all the way here, yeah. And, uh, to the mouse. Okay. <laughs> Clearing, yeah, okay. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, there you are. Life is hard. How does that get activated? I don't think I pressed on anything. I don't understand. Okay, anyway, fantastic. So what we're going to do now is to look at the topic. 
Everything okay? Seems so. I don't want to convert files to PDF, but that's another matter. Uh, what I wanted to do you to do now is to uh, get started on uh, our next topic that apparently has nothing to do at all with computer science. I say apparently because, in fact, it does have something to do with computer science. We are going to look at the topic of infinity, which for us computer scientists is a very, is a very odd topic. Why? Because everything we do is finite. In fact, probably, if we want to be philosophical, infinity does not even exist. But it's a concept that is uh, that any good, honest to God computer scientist should come to grips with. So, to set the stage, let me uh, introduce you to the concept of the ideal computer. Now, the ideal computer is not like the laptops that people are looking at right here, right now, listening to me, uh, or perhaps not listening to me, but that doesn't matter. I don't hold any grudges. Uh, the ideal computer is uh, a computer that never runs out of memory. You know what? That's the one we would like to have. Every time uh, the computer might be about to run out of memory, a maintenance health comes and adds say 100 gigabytes of RAM, so that you never actually ran out of memory. So it's a computer with an unlimited supply of memory. Need terabytes, you have them. Need petabytes, you have them. You have more than that. You have an unlimited memory supply. The question that we will be asking ourselves from today and until the next lecture is, can an ideal computer be programmed to print out the decimal expansion of every real number? Everybody knows what the real numbers are? Pi, square root of 2, e, 2, 1, 1 1.5. These are all real numbers. For some numbers, we know we can do it. Huh? There are algorithms for printing out the digits of pi. And there are even weirdos out there that memorize the digits of pi up to several thousands digital, digital places. Fantastic. But can we do it for all the real numbers? That's the question that we are going to address. And to understand this, we need to go to infinity and beyond. And if you get a little bit mind bogged, you're Rest assured, you're not the first ones. So, let me start by addressing the issue of when two different sets have the same cardinality. What does that mean? First of all, we all know what sets are, don't we? If not, scream now. Okay, so what does it mean for two sets to have the same cardinality? Your colleague here is saying they have the same number of elements. But what does that mean? Okay, for, for two finite sets, that's easy. I can count the number of elements. But how many elements does the set of natural numbers have? You cannot count them all. It's an infinite set. So counting somehow doesn't quite work for infinite sets. However, there is an equivalent version of the notion of counting that works both for finite and infinite sets. And it's the concept of establishing a correspondence between the elements of the set A and of the set B. Now, this is not an arbitrary correspondence. It's something that is called a bijection. It's a function from A to B that is both injective and surjective. You know what I'm about to ask? Does any of these three adjectives make sense to you? Bijective, injective, surjective. It should, because you've seen them in discrete maths one. 
but it was in a previous life. So let me summarize for you. Injective means that no two elements of A are mapped to the same element. So F keeps two distinct elements distinct. Surjective means every element of B is the image of an element of A. That is to say, for every element of B, there is one element of A, and in fact, if the map is by bijection only one, that gets mapped by F to that element. Okay? So, uh, pictorially, that's what I just said. For the case of finite sets, you have a set X, contains the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and a set Y contains A, B, C, D, and this is a bijection between the two sets that establishes that the two sets have the same cardinality. Why do I say this is even more fundamental than counting? Because sometimes to figure out that two sets don't have the same cardinality, I don't need to count. Why? Let me give you an example for the people who are here in the lecture room. I don't need to count to figure out that there are more seats than people in this room. Why? Because the people who are sitting there give me an injective correspondence, but not surjective correspondence, between the students in the room and the seats. Why do I, why do I know that this is not a surjection? Because there are empty seats. And since I don't see any two of you sitting in the same place, I know that the correspondence is injective. So, why don't we take this more basic definition as our definition of when two sets have the same cardinality? You have a set A and a set B, they have the same cardinality if you can construct a bijection from A to B. Everything that is a correspondence between the elements of A and the elements of B, that is one-to-one -one and injected, like the one that you see here. We say that the set is finite if there is a bijection between that set and an initial sequence of the natural numbers. This can be done with A as N elements. It is infinite if that's not possible. You cannot have a bijection between some initial fragment of the natural numbers and that set A. This sets the stage for what we are going to see on Tuesday. Where your minds will fry. But in a positive way. Because we are going to explore a concept that, as the writer Jorge Luis Borges said, is the most damaging for the human, the human mind. Forget about evil. Evil is damaging, but the infinite is much worse. As soon as you start thinking about infinity, you go mad. And so some people, this has actually happened. Uh, Georg Cantor, who was the father of all the theory of infinite set, spent most of the latter part of his life in and out of mental hospitals. So this is not going to happen to us, I hope, uh, but we will need to think a little bit about something which is truly weird. Not just for you, for everyone. Unless you're a mathematician that special, who specializes in set theory, which is the branch of mathematics that deals with sets. Okay, so that's the trailer. So then next time, we are going to ask ourselves, when are two infinite sets of the same cardinality? How many orders of infinity there are out there? Because if you talk about people in normal life, they will say, oh, this thing is infinite. Well, is there only one order of infinity, or there are more? And if there are more, how many are there there are? And the answer is mind-boggling. Just like uh, the writing screen here, a writing tool for me sometimes. Okay, and on this uh, note of hope, uh, be ready to be fried next time around. So bring along some uh, whatever you like with fried stuff. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for your help.